situated here. So I want to um, thank Tanya and Frank for inviting me to write an essay for the book, to come and speak. And um, it's been five years since I've been in the Bay Area, since I, let me see, I lived here from 2005 to about 2013, but I was working in the, in the North Bay through 2017, 2018. So it's great to be back. Um, I'm now in Santa Fe, so I am kind of overwhelmed with all the moisture. <laughs> uh, that's why I have my coat on. <laughs> I'm like, I'm cold. It's weird because it's like 30 degrees there. But um, I guess I'll start out with uh, how I met Bonnie. Um, I reached, well, I started doing research on art, artists addressing environmental issues in the early 90s. And probably about 95, 96, I reached out to Bonnie, I think through email. Maybe we had a phone conversation. But she came to Los Angeles. Uh, I just had my son, and she came over to my house, and we bonded. And I moved to Topanga Canyon a little after that. And there was a, a library that was going to be built in our little community. and. She was very much advocating that I should do, you know, pr propose to the uh, the county to do um, a living library there at the at the library there in, in Topanga. But yeah, you know, like Eco Art Space started in '97. Um, I found I came up with a concept for it in '97, and really for probably the first 10 years, it was mainly educating institutions and curators about this work, what the artists were doing. A lot of them had remembered earth art, land art from the 70s, late 60s, but um, weren't really up to date on, on what artists were doing. So I'm not going to talk about Bonnie's early work, her portable parks, or sitting still, or the farm. I'm going to pick up somewhere in between, like in the 80s and 90s. I'm not even going to talk about a living library either. So I'm in this kind of liminal space that I feel um, is important to know about and Frank touched on it a little bit. Um, I guess everybody did who spoke just now. But uh, you know, what was the climate like? Artists worked in a very different way than they do today. Um, there's much more grants, funding for, and a lot of permissions given through arts institutions rather than going directly to the source, unless you're working in the public art department. Um, so. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of taking some ep excerpts from my essay. Um, I did want to point out that I have done two interviews with her. Uh, the first in 2018, which was for the Eco Art Space Archive. And I uh, basically had specific projects that I wanted her to talk about, and she did that. But I had a uh, second opportunity to interview her in 2021 for Site Santa Fe. It was during the pandemic, so it was on Zoom. <laughs> And um, I, I wanted to really do more of a Smithsonian type interview, so I got into her childhood. And sometimes those questions are not what artists want to talk about. <laughs> and I do feel like she kind of resisted me for a little while, but I, you know, and I think maybe they think that when they're getting interviewed, they, I'm not dead yet, you know, like don't <laughs> put me in that box. Um, so. What I learned and what was really interesting um, that she attended Douglas Residential College, which was a part of Rutgers, but um, she uh, was taught under Robert Watts, who was a Fluxus artist, and her classmates were Jacqueline Windsor, Keith Saunier, and Joan Schneider. Um, she also got to meet Billy Kuvler, who um, was one of the um, engineers who promoted collaborations with artists and co-founded the uh, EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology. So she had a really interesting um, undergraduate um, experience. And so she brought that with her when she came to San Francisco in 67 at 21 years old, or 22 she was, I guess. Um, and then she met Mel Henderson, who she um, and Tanya has written about him and I think done some shows on his work. But And he was new to me when I came to the Bay Area. I didn't really know about his early pieces. And I write a little bit about that in my essay. Um, but she liked him a lot. And she really felt like when she got here that he was like the only real kind of global thinker that she could identify with coming from like in her program at Douglas, she was also going into New York City, and she said she met Nam June Pike, and I mean, her, 
her ideas about art and the art world that she brought with her were pretty radical. Um, so when she got here in 1968, I am going a little bit into her history here, but um, you know, this was a time that Ruth Asawa had co-founded the Al Al Alvarado School Arts Workshop, a program uh, offered to school children throughout San Francisco where they learned about color and design uh, while observing objects in nature. Um, I also got to work with Ruth um, or her family, uh, Paul Lanier, on a show in, in 2008. Um, but um, so from here, yeah, I just, just want to talk a little bit about her influences because I think they're important. But I'm going to fast forward through the 70s, as I said. Um, and what's important is when she left the farm in 1980, um, you know, she had served as an administrator, board president, grant writer, gardener, teacher, designer, and sometimes cook. Uh, after six highly engaged years, years, she decided to leave the farm and educate herself further on ecological systems, eventually taking classes in landscape architecture to gain practical tools in preparation for what would become, I, I call her decades long swan song, the uh, all. <coughs> Um, so, you know, the 80s is when she, in 1981, um, kind of, you know, she came up with the idea for a living library. Um, by 92, she had written a bus business plan. So the 80s, not a lot of work, but uh, kind of preparing herself for how she would approach um, creating this kind of long-term project. But by 92, she had written a business plan and um, established Life Frames, a, a nonprofit vehicle for fundraising for all. And uh, she titled herself the founding director, president, use that word. Um, though still, she considered this work uh, a form of ecological art and herself a, an artist. So I like to say that the 80s were it was kind of like the decade of avarice and greed. It was like Wall Street and, you know, I think the art world, there was a percent for art program that had started, uh, evolved much further in the, into the 90s. But, you know, you really had to have like a business sense. I mean, I went to undergraduate school in the early 80s and we were all very business-like. In fact, I have an undergraduate degree in business. So um, I, I related with Bonnie that way because I liked the way she, she um, straddled being an artist and also being somebody who could be respected in a, in a business capacity, you know, like the applying for grants. And um, so, and a parallel artist who was a friend of hers that she met in the 80s here in San Francisco was Betsy Damon. So, I don't know how many of you know about her work, but, um, and I'll talk about Bonnie a little bit. Oh, I am not using my slides in my. Um, how does this work here? The little green button in the middle? The, not the starburst one, the arrow. Up the top. Oh, up at top, okay. Oh, that one, okay. <laughs> the, the big one. Okay, so sorry, that was my slide for her background. Uh, there's Ruth at Alvarado. And just a quick, I'm not gonna be talking about the farm. Um, and then the living library. So here we are. So coming into the 80s, um, yeah, some of the artists who she worked with, and unfortunately artists I am gonna talk about today, I did not get in my essay who are Bay Area artists who were influenced by her or um, you know, were her peers or uh, provided inspiration for other artists. Um, so Bonnie, or excuse me, Betsy was one of those people in, in the early 90s, but also Joe Hansen. So I have this light up, I'll finish this one up. Um, so Joe was uh, born in 1918. She was 25 years older than Bonnie. Um, she arrived in, in uh, I think like early 70s and had started doing her sweeping of Buchanan um, Street or Avenue, I forget what it, which it is. Um, 
So from what I understand, they were not uh, best of friends or anything, but they knew each other. And Bonnie had left the farm in 1980, and in 1981, Joe had uh, done some work at, at the farm. And that's also interesting how you know, she leaves it, but it lives on. And other artists like Tim Collins and Reiko Goto also were doing work there. I believe they were married there. Um, and, uh, and then Betsy, who had met her in the 80s, by the early 90s, um, okay, I've got it down. Um, the, Betsy and uh, Bonnie connected because Betsy was working on uh, her uh, nonprofit platform called Keepers of the Waters, and she was working on a big project in China. So the two of them would compare notes and you know, it was very unheard of for artists to create their own foundations, their own 501c3s, but when you're applying for public art projects and you have to get business license, and um, it was a very different approach to, um, especially with public art. And that's also what I want to talk about right now, is the 90s for eco art, ecological art, the artists were much uh, looking at the big picture and wanting to do multi-year projects. And I don't know, sometimes I think about it as inspired by just what funding was available. The EPA had a lot of money to give for restoration projects, so artists were like, how could I, I you know, collaborate with a biologist to do a restoration of a wetlands? There was a lot of wet, wet, wetlands restoration money at that time. But, um, and I think it also maybe was influenced by land art. I think there's a whole generation of artists who were, you know, thinking, you know, just, yeah, bigger. Because by 2000, it becomes very much in, in your backyard, which was good. <laughs> um, but and as I mentioned, the Percent for Art projects and all that, so I think I've kind of painted a picture of how an artist might, you know, want to become more business-like in, in that climate then. Um, so, so I'm just going to uh, review real quickly the Bay Area artists. How am I for time? Are you? OK, wrap it up. Um, so let's see here. Projects like The Farm and Sitting Still were very influential for um, Susan Steinman, who worked with Andre Singer Thompson and created Back to the Garden in Berkeley in 1993. It was the first art farm to appear since The Farm uh, dis disappeared, as Sue Spade stated in her book Green Acres. Shaped like a recycled arrow, the raised green or the raised bed gardens featured numerous stations moving from compost to plants to fruit trees and back to compost. So there was also a kind of an homage to Meryl Latterman Euclid's her ceremonial arch, which you can see there used with the the um, cans. But Susan came on the scene around 1988, and they were the exact same age, Susan Steinman and Bonnie. Um, and it kind of appears that, I mean, bon Susan gives credit to Bonnie, but I think in some ways probably Bonnie was also influenced by uh, what Susan was able to achieve with, um, with this, but also uh, Urban Apple Orchard uh, was commissioned by the San Francisco Art Commission for the Market Street Art and Transit Program. Um, and then a, a much larger project from 98 to 99, Susan did a uh, Mandela Artscape in Oakland, which um, she collaborated with Caltrans, the city of Oakland, Merritt College, Museum of Children's Art. So Bonnie hadn't really blossomed yet in her projects when Susan was taking inspiration from Bonnie's work and, and actually you know, making them happen here in the Bay Area. Another uh, artist, real quick, is Erica Fielder, um, inspired by Bonnie's Sitting Still. She did a project called Standing Still. Sorry, that's the other two projects by Susan. So that was a Sitting Still image. So these are Erica Fielder's Standing Still. Uh, one artist's response to envir environmental de degradation, and that's in Fort Bragg. 
So she would um, stand for an hour each day, several days a week, mostly answered a few questions and then held silence. Often passersby would stop and stood with me for several minutes and her signs basically said, uh, you reduce air pollution, you slow the cutting of trees, you stop consuming for a moment, you avoid throwing things away, you halt the race, remember what you forgot, and that's standing still. And that turned into um, a bird feeder project where she sits and lets birds come sit on her, on her hat and feed. I think there's bird, bird feed on there. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up with Betsy. Uh, this is the Living Water Garden, which she did in Ch Chengdu, China. Um, and something that's interesting with Betsy's project was uh, she worked with a landscape architect, uh, Margie Ruddick. And oftentimes, early on, when she would talk about her project, she never mentioned Margie. So I found out about Margie later, and I know now that Betsy does give her more credit. But I think there was a kind of a dance, and that was something that Bonnie was smart to do, was she learned how to illustrate and design from a landscape perspective. And because um, I think that there was a lot of worry around if you worked with a landscape designer, then is that art or is that landscape design? And um, so I'm, I'm sure I could probably interview Betsy and get more information on that, but I'm sure that was a lot of their, their conversations around you know, is it art? Um, and then I'm going to finish with this image of um, Bonnie, who's hugging Betsy and uh, other artists there. There's um, Aviva, uh, Andre Thompson, um, let's see, Wendy Brower at the very end on your left, and next to her is Linda Weintraub. So they are all Capricorns, and they meet in January. <laughs> for their birthday. So uh, in conclusion, I'm gonna recite the last paragraph of my essay. Um, was she ahead of her time or simply of her time uh, with her own models of inspiration and the admirers who followed? Maybe all branches are already potentially everywhere. It's not a matter of who did what first, it's about how we can work together for the greater good for our survival. Shirk has left us with a legacy of bold ideas to consider with her ultimate goal being to connect gardeners, teachers, youth, and community members globally who are working to undevelop and regenerate urban spaces. Now it's our turn through, our turn to follow through on Shirk's vision to create a green gateway to all. <laughs>